exciting times for the Oklahoma Sooners. We're going to hear from Brent Venables and what he had to say in his last media availability about getting started as a head coach and what that's going to look like for him. We're also going to talk about some news on the business of college football and the playoff. We got that and more on today's episode of Locked On Sooners. You are Locked On Sooners, your daily podcast on the Oklahoma Sooners, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up, Sooner Nation, and welcome to Locked On Sooners. Thank you so much for making Locked On Sooners your first listen every single day. We are free and available on all podcast platforms. My name is John Williams. You can follow me on Twitter at John9Williams. You can read my work covering the Oklahoma Sooners over at the Sooners Wire. He's Josh Helmer. You can follow him on Twitter at JoshOnRef. You can also hear him Monday through Friday on 94.7 The Ref in Norman from 9 to noon. Josh, we are almost there. So close. If you're waking up on Thursday morning, you're going to be two days away from the opening of the 2022 season for the Oklahoma Sooners. How are you feeling, man? Are you pumped? I'm pumped. I'm ready to go. Can't wait to see what Saturday in 2022 just has in store for Oklahoma. I mean, we've spent so much time thinking and prognosticating and just kind of fantasizing about what this season might look like for OU. Now the fact that we get those answers. I mean, this is what it's all about, right? It's about the thrill of game day and reacting to both positive and negative. And here it is. It's, it's finally here. So it's, it's very, very exciting. I'm, of course I'm pumped, man. Are you pumped? Dude, I can't wait to see that team run out onto the field the very first time under Brent Venables. Can't wait to see him on the sidelines. It's just, I don't know, man. I think it's going to be everything that we hoped it was going to be, at least that first game We'll see how the rest of the season plays out. I think we're both pretty optimistic of how the season plays out. But, man, exciting times. Let's hear from Brent Venables himself. Exciting time um, for the 22 team. Uh, team 128 uh, couldn't be more excited to just go watch them play. Um, it's that time to go play somebody else, to go compete, and um, kind of see where we're at. So um, got UTEP coming in here as we've – Said all all along as well. It's really it's about us, and um, you know a, a veteran team's coming in here uh, from El Paso, um, but I, I really want to see our guys uh, compete, you know, to the standards of uh, Oklahoma football you know, with uncommon effort and toughness and discipline, physicality uh, to play the game the right way in all three phases. Uh, excited to see a bunch of. Uh, young guys we have, I believe it's uh, over 50% of our roster has never been in a, in a, a Sooner football game. So that's exciting um, to us. I know there's been a, uh, a bunch of freshman guys that just got here um, that are in that too deep as well. Um, but from the, the transfers and the freshmen and then guys that maybe have been here uh, in the past uh, prior to um, January uh, that haven't been in a game as well. So... Uh, it's exciting to me um, to get an opportunity to mold them and shape them and see them go compete for the first time out here in this stadium is a really uh, neat thing to be a part of. And I think that's true for a lot of us. We're just excited to see this team take the field, whatever it ends up looking like. And I think that's just kind of carrying over from what last November, December felt like, you know, that last couple days of November, first week of December, Now we're about to see this team take the field under Brent Venables, and there's so many things to look forward to. There's so many new guys that we're going to get our first glimpse of as Sooners, especially these first couple weeks of the season. You know, he he mentioned the freshmen. This is the time where we get a a really good chance to see the freshmen on the field. And there's, as Brent Venables laid out for you, there's a good number of instant impact guys potentially for Oklahoma. So we'll get our first glimpse. UTEP, maybe not the best indication, I guess, of that, John, right? I mean, some of these young guys we're going to see because, well, it's UTEP and you're probably going to win this game fairly convincingly. Same thing for Kent State. So maybe these first two weeks we can only take bits and pieces out of in terms of what it kind of like long term projects out to be for uh, Oklahoma's, you know, main contributors. But 
I do expect to see a lot of different faces on Saturday for Oklahoma. And, you know, as Brent Vittable said, as you said, John, I just can't wait to see this team. I can't wait to see the way that you react out there at the Palace on the Prairie. I can't wait to see just the environment and the excitement and to get to be a part of this moment that is, you know, the start, the the dawning, the beckoning of a new era of Oklahoma football that we all hope is great and special. Yeah, and one of the things that I think a lot of us are looking forward to seeing is how does Brent Venables make that transition from coordinator to head coach where the game takes on a whole different animal. Like you, you have decisions that you're making now that you didn't have to make as the defensive coordinator. You have things that you have to be aware of on the offensive side of the football that you didn't have to be aware of as the defensive coordinator. Let's hear what Brent Venables had to say about that. Um, I have visited with not all of them, but I have visited, uh, not in the last couple of days, but uh, in the past. And, of course, I got Matt Wells on staff um, that's been a head coach. And so that's one of the reasons, um, uh, amongst others, that we uh, you know, like the idea of bringing him on board. Like he, he could help. It's another you surround yourself with, with experience and wisdom um, and always willing to learn. So, you know, it'll until you go through it, I'm, I can imagine nobody has had to tell me that, you know, until you go through it, uh, you know, you don't really know. But, again, you just – it's football and you're in a leadership position. I feel like I've been that uh, – uh, a little bit different role in some ways and, and some the same, the exact same. And But you got to be aware of everything going on in regards to management. And uh, uh, so as opposed to being on that whiteboard until somebody tells you that you it's time for the defense to go back out, you know, that that's going to be different. But I, there's going to be times when I need to be on a whiteboard just because that's what I want to do. And uh, But i gotta I got to manage the whole team too. And in the game itself. And again, I'm relying on other people to help in that management, but ultimately it's my responsibility. And uh, so that's, I'm, I'm incredibly excited about it. Um, we've uh, gone through our mock uh, games, and but nothing is going to be like the actual game day itself. Nothing is going to be like the actual game day itself. I, I think truer words haven't been spoken because – you can do what you can do in practice. You can have these scrimmages. You can even have the spring game. But once you're in an environment where you're playing a different team that doesn't know your tendencies, you don't necessarily know their tendency, like all of their tendencies. You can watch film, but that doesn't give you every indication of what they're going to do. And the flow of a game and, and knowing when to go for it on fourth down, knowing when to punt, knowing when to kick field goals, and knowing, again, when to go for it, knowing when to call timeouts. Knowing when to you know slow your team down, you know, knowing when to tell Jeff Levy to keep going up tempo, keep the pace up. Like I think a lot of those things are going to be really interesting to follow as this first game unfolds because I, I think we want to see Jeff Levy's up tempo offense, and we know that that's going to be a big part of this Oklahoma Sooners team. At the same time, once you get a big lead, you don't want to keep going up tempo because that's going to give the ball back to the other team faster. You want to slow things down and then start grinding out the clock. So that's one of the things I'm going to be really curious about. The thing that I really loved about what Brent Venable said, and it's kind of contrary to what Scott Frost did after the Nebraska loss to Northwestern, he says, you know, I've delegated some things out to other people. I'm relying on them, but ultimately it's my responsibility. Yeah. I mean, the buck stops with me, right? I'm the head football coach at the university of Oklahoma and ultimately fair or foul, it's going to fall on Brent Venables, right? I mean, that's just the nature of being the head football coach. Get all the credit, get uh, get all of the, the blame. I like one thing that he touched on there too, John, which I am now – I don't know if I'm affectionately referring to it as this, but I am referring to it as this chalkboard syndrome, right? Yeah. A new, new head coaches, I think, always are kind of fighting that. And even at times, long-tenured head coaches – maybe are fighting the the chalkboard syndrome a little bit. I, you know, not to just every turn bring this back to Lincoln Riley and take a shot at Lincoln Riley, but was Lincoln Riley maybe not concerned enough with what was going on defensively with Oklahoma? I mean, did he fight that chalkboard syndrome in terms of being a little bit too hands-on, 
offensively with Oklahoma, not delegating a little bit, honestly, even offensively to some of his coordinators for Oklahoma. And then just defensively, was was he just not as dialed in there as uh, maybe other head coaches? I don't know. I can't totally speak to that, though there were some of those accusations founded or unfounded about Oklahoma. So, you know, we're going to find out about Brent Venables, right? This is somebody that has been very, very involved in being the architect of some of college football's greatest defenses. Can he, can he let go of some of that when the timing is right and focus on being the CEO of Oklahoma football? We don't, we don't really know the, the answer to that question yet. I think it helps that he brings in a guy like Ted Roof who had, he has a strong relationship with, strong trust with. I mean, I think if he were kind of elevating somebody who hasn't been a defensive coordinator before, there might be less of a tendency to be able to let go of it. But because you've been, you're able to hand it off to somebody who's been in the game for a long time, been a defensive coordinator at several different stops and had some success, it's easier to let it go. You know what I mean? Like it's easier to, to hand that off. I think maybe part of the reason that Lincoln Riley wasn't able to, maybe he didn't feel like he had an offensive coordinator in the making that he could hand it off to. But I think we saw in the Alamo Bowl with Kale Gundy calling the plays that he did. Like there was a guy that probably could have called the offense pretty effectively and had some good scoring output. We'll see. We'll see what happens when when you know things get tight and the defense might be having a, a series or two where they're struggling to get stops. We'll see if Brent Venables is able to kind of like still put that trust and put that faith and and the delegatory you know action towards Ted Roof. I don't think there's going to be a situation where he's not kind of always involved. I think he's going to keep involved, keep in their ear. But I also think he'll he'll keep in the ear of Jeff Levy offensively too. Like you know if like I said before, if they get to a point where they need to start slowing things down, well Brent Venables will make that call. He'll say, hey, let's start slowing the game down. Let's run the clock. Let's run the ball. Let's pound it away. Still, we can get to the line of scrimmage fast, but let's take off more of the clock. You know, we can keep the pressure on by getting to the line of scrimmage right away and then slow it down a little bit. So that'll be really interesting. I, I, I think that's probably the most fascinating aspect of this game is how Brent Venables manages it. Again, we, we've, we've talked about this ad nauseum. He's learned from some of the best in college football. And so his ability to manage a football game, I think is going to be greatly enhanced because he spent so much time learning from the Bill Snyder's, Bob Stoops, Dabo Sweeney. And so I think, will he make mistakes? Every coach makes, you know, bad decisions in football games. It's inevitable. There's not a coach out there that's coached a long time that hasn't made a poor game management decision. It's just going to happen. Um, But early in the season, I think what we want to see is, few of those like very little of those but just kind of making good process decisions even if it doesn't work out sometimes the execution is not there the play doesn't work out the way you want the fourth down call doesn't go the way you want it to but is the process right you know what i mean that'll be the thing that i think i'm looking forward to watching so josh we got some college football playoff news we've got some big 12 media rights extension news that came down as well but we can't in this first segment talking about head coaches without talking about the shot that Dari Noka from ESPN threw out there at Lincoln Riley. And now this has been a popular theme over the last uh, week since USC dropped its hype video uh, that featured several Oklahoma Sooners quarterbacks during the Lincoln Riley tenure. Uh, And Dari had this to say, he said, this is adorable. Baker and Kyler were nothing without Lincoln, I guess. He's being sarcastic. Nice to feature the at OU football program and your little Lincoln hype video. For the record, he did nothing Bob Stoops didn't do before him. But fight on, guys. Go ahead. And I think that's a clear distinction. Like, that's, a, that's an important distinction to make. Like, Lincoln Riley had how many Heisman Trophy winners? Two. He had a Heisman finalist as well. Bob Stoops had how many Heisman Trophy winners? Two. He also had several other Heisman finalists as well, like Dee Dee, Baker. I mean, Baker was a Heisman finalist under Bob Stoops. I believe uh, Josh Heupel was a Heisman finalist as well. So like, this is a guy that yes, he had some success, but Oklahoma was Oklahoma before Lincoln Riley. It's going to be Oklahoma after Lincoln Riley. Things are going to be just fine. Agreed. I just love that Dari Noka, who is one of the nicest guys really in the business and boomer sooner through and through it's, it must've tugged on his heartstrings a little bit for him to jump into the fray 
that's not very Dari esque. It's a little out of character for him. And I gotta say, the heel turn, I'm here for it with Dari Noka. That's right. He's gonna wave that sooner flag proudly. And hey, we need we need somebody to be the anti Colin Coward. We need somebody in the major media to uh, to rep OU and shout out to OU alum Dari Noka. Uh, Josh, let's talk bet online. The Oklahoma Sooners they're coming into this matchup with a minus 31 point spread over UTEP. The over-under is sitting at 57. You want to get in on some futures actions, you can go to Oklahoma. Nine and a half is the win total projection. I said the worst case scenario on our show yesterday was nine wins. I believe this is a 10, 11 win team. And I even told, I even said my bold prediction, they're going undefeated. So you want to get in on bet online. You want to take that nine and a half win total and take the over on that. I highly recommend it. I got in on it, you know, months ago when it was sitting at eight and a half, which to me was just absolutely ludicrous, but go to bet online. It's the number one source for all your sports betting needs. They've got every major sport covered, MMA, boxing, golf, major league baseball. You can get in on NBA and NFL futures as well. NHL is there. So head to the website, use your mobile device to learn more about the trends in action. Bet online is where the game starts. Okay, Josh. So the first news item that we need to touch on is, so the Big 12 released a statement saying, hey, we're going to be exploring media rights extension options. Um, This got picked up by ESPN, CBS, The Athletic. Everybody went to their sources, found that, yeah, they're going to begin discussions with uh, ESPN and Fox on trying to extend their media rights deal. Now, this is important because the PAC-12 just tried to do the same thing, had a 30-day negotiating window, were not able to come to an extension agreement, and so now the Big 12 steps up to the plate. And we begin to wonder, okay, what's the future media rights deal look like for the Big 12? They're looking like a conference that might be able to sit in that kind of number three spot or number four spot, like right there with the ACC behind the Big 10 and SEC. But what does it mean for Oklahoma and for Texas, who are two programs that are trying to get out of the out of the Big 12 to the SEC a little bit early, early earlier than 2025, which is the first opportunity that they have under their current media rights agreements? Josh, what do you think that this means for these two schools? I don't know. You know, obviously the reports came down pretty quickly after the uh, initial report, which was the Big 12, as you said, looking to renegotiate its. Uh, TV rights deals with both Fox and ESPN. Then boom, immediately right after that, the reports came down from Dennis Dodd, several others that basically Oklahoma and Texas, they they were looking now for that early exit to kind of renegotiate their buyout potentially with the big 12 conference, because the big 12 obviously went to go renegotiate its deal before uh, obviously the Grand Brides were well, have expired. So I don't know what that means for Oklahoma and Texas. I don't think this, though. You know, I saw a lot of people kind of drawing this piece of yarn over here to this other point, which was the the Big 12 is trying to negotiate this because it meant Oklahoma and Texas had already informed them that they were they were out after this season. I don't think that's what's going on with the Big 12 conference. I think Oklahoma and Texas reacted based on what the Big 12 did to potentially better their little buyout situation to get to the SEC quicker. Probably that was always the plans for Oklahoma and Texas. I mean, how many times have we discussed that or thought about that and kind of feel like this is the final year in the Big 12? And why would OU and Texas want to play in a 14-team type league that isn't the SEC or the Big 10? I mean, I, I don't know. Why, why would they want to do that, right? Probably they're going to try and use this as an opportunity to get out a little bit early, but I really thought that this was to me, John, about the big 12, again, as you illustrated beautifully, PAC 12's negotiating, negotiating window comes to a close. Big 12 jumps in and says, okay, let's try and get our future cash. Now let's see if we can get this thing inked with Fox, with ESPN. And let's see if we can't get some escalators put into this thing too. That way we can entice in Oregon, entice a Washington, in Tyson, Arizona, Arizona State, Colorado, Utah, that if we get this deal done, and oh, by the way, if you come join us in the Big 12, then all of us get X, Y, Z in terms of dollars. I just, that's how it reads to me. Maybe that's dead wrong, but that was sort of my initial reaction to all of it. Yeah, that's kind of where I stand too, is that the, the Big 12, Brett Yormark, 
they're going to be aggressive players in the conference realignment game. They're not sitting back on their heels, waiting to see how things transpire and then reacting to things. They see a weakened Pac-12 with USC and UCLA headed to the Big Ten, and they know that this is their time to strike to further solidify themselves as a as a conference in the future. I think where they stand, even at the 12 teams that they'll be at when Oklahoma and Texas leave, I think it's a solid conference. Do they have like the big time, you know, blue blood programs? Not necessarily, but they've got a lot of really strong media markets and the schools that aren't in strong media markets, they're in strong college football towns like Ames and Morgantown and Stillwater and Manhattan and you know, you t- talk about Lawrence as far as a basketball town goes, you know, and then you do have a couple really good media markets in F- Dallas, Fort Worth for TCU, Houston, and Cincinnati. Like those are strong media markets. You, you know, Orlando for UCF. So I think what they're trying to do, what Brett Yormark is trying to do, is further position themselves as a major player. If they can get this right, this media rights extension done, like you said, with escalators that are able to entice a Washington and Oregon. I mean, that sets them up to be just right there with, to me, the Big Ten, the SEC. Again, they may not have the blue bloods, but I think the brand of football that they're going to be able to put on the field is going to be as exciting as anything else. Like They're going to have a really, really strong brand and a really strong conference with a lot of really strong teams. And and so I, I think this is just Brett Yormark being aggressive. And I think we we knew this was going to come. His comments at Big 12 Media Days where the Big 12 is open for business so this is not all that surprising that they're going to be aggressive. They're going to be players. They're going to try and get a deal done that's not only going to solidify the current state of the Big 12, or at least what the Big 12 will be when the new members join, but also to set themselves up to add teams, add programs in the future as well, so that they're right there on the cusp of being a 16, 18, 20 team conference down the road. I, I love the idea of being aggressive and going after Oregon and Washington because why not? You know, according to most reports, those are kind of the two bigger brands that don't really have a home. And if you want to have that Northwest market, what better way to, to, to get that solidified than have those guys? I think we know that the corner school, the four corner schools and the Arizona's, the Colorado, Utah, they're part of the expansion. Um, plan for the big 12 but if they can somehow find a way to get or uh, oregon and washington involved in that too and that would be that'd be killer for them i mean just think of the games that you would have on your schedule then if you add oregon and washington i mean i even think just adding utah and byu or adding utah to byu would be huge like that's one of the best oldest rivalries in college football the holy war and if you add that to your big 12 slate yes it's not ou texas but it goes a long way to helping to kind of mitigate the loss of OU Texas. Well, and Utah now has made itself into a legitimate brand, John. I mean, they're right now with Oregon, Utah's your defending Pac-12 champion. So they're kind of right there at the top with Oregon as the right now kind of year in year out power. It feels like in the Pac-12 conference. So if you can add that and, you know, you pair it back with the rival in BYU. I don't know if BYU fans are necessarily thrilled about that idea. I think they'd kind of like to leave Utah out in the dark. But for the Big 12, I can definitely understand why that would be attractive. And I think as as much as you can continue to keep going, keep going west, if you can, then, uh, yeah, bring in schools from the west. I mean, and I don't think it's crazy. If you're the Big 12 and you get some sort of deal that's inked and you get escalators put into the contract, John, to where – you could add up to six more schools, eight schools, like basically just merge with the Pac-12, but keep it, I don't know, the Big 12 Conference or the Big Central West Conference. I don't know what it would be called, but just basically having that language written in there that, hey, if we absorb all of these different schools, then, you know, our member institutions, the payout per school, the average doesn't drop. And in fact, maybe it goes up. Yeah, I think if you are able to add markets in the Northwest, I think that gives you more marketability and it gives the the networks that are paying for this more eyes. And that's what really what it's all about is television sets and eyeballs because they want to be able to put as many eyeballs as they can in front of advertisers. That's what TV is all about. My dad has been telling me for years, TV was invented for advertising, not so that we could be entertained, but so that we could 
advertised products so that we as a consumer would see them and be like, oh, I want to buy that. Well, that's what college football is all about. As much as we love the game, on the TV side of things, it's about selling ad spots and generating revenue. That's what the networks pay billions of dollars for is the opportunity to sell more billions of dollars in ad revenue. So I think adding the Northwest schools, I mean, even just adding Salt Lake City and you know Tempe and Phoenix and Tucson, uh, getting you know Boulder and Denver like that. Those are really strong markets, and that that's that's going to help the Big Twelve grow its brand. But man, if they could figure out a way to add the Northwest, that's that's even killer. Now on the college football playoff front, more reports came down. It was I think Chris Vanini over at the Athletic that first reported that the committee, the the governors of the college football playoff, are looking at voting on expansion to a twelve team uh, playoff that probably wouldn't take place um, maybe till 2024 or 2026, just depending on how all the things work out. I'm excited about this. I'm, I love a big playoff. I love the NFL because it creates this opportunity for anytime, anywhere kind of a situation. I really hope that this passes this time. I hope that people don't get in their feels and decide that they want to pull their votes back because we almost had an agreement for a 12 team playoff nine months ago. And three conferences decided, nah, you know what? We're going to wait and see on this as opposed to decide, yes, let's make more money. Kevin Warren convinced the ACC and the PAC 12 that they didn't want to expand and then went and poached the two most prominent members from the PAC 12. So, and now if you're Kevin Warren, you said, okay, well, okay, now we're cool with expanding, right? Because we, we got uh, the two biggest brands out of the PAC 12. Now we'd really like to uh, enhance our opportunity to get some of that, cash back to the big 10 conference with uh, you know, as many members as we can get into the college football playoff. If you're the PAC 12 and ACC and big 12 now, because of the defections of Oklahoma and Texas to the sec and the defections of USC and UCLA to the big 10. I mean, now more than ever, John, if you can sign me up, I'm the PAC 12 commish. I'm Brett, your Mark. You can sign me up to get my team's, the, the champion and automatic berth into the college football playoff and then a number of at-large bids as well, where do I sign to A, get more money, and B, have more inclusion and a guaranteed path into the college football playoff? I thought it was, I, I thought it was a no, you know, slam dunk, no-brainer back then, and now for the Pac-12 and Big 12 and really the ACC who – I don't know that they're just out of the woods in all of this yet, John, either, because as soon as the SEC or Big Ten decides, yeah, we'll take Clemson or Florida State, then guess what? They're taking Clemson and Florida State. So for all of those three leagues to to get access to the playoff, to get guaranteed access to the playoff and get it now and get it in writing to prevent, you know, potentially that doomsday scenario for the other three, John, where the Big Ten and SEC are essentially in an AFC, NFC Super Bowl scenario. I mean, I think you kind of have to guard against that if you're some of the other power brokers in college football. So as much as it's kind of at times seemed like we're not ever going to get progress in college football, this this could get done quickly. I mean, it sounds like maybe as early as Friday. I'll still pump the brakes a little bit and say I'll believe it when I see it, John, but it makes sense for a bunch of the parties involved. And I think the thing that most excites me about this is that it increases the number of teams – that are in contention for a national championship later in the season. You know, anymore, even as the college football playoff is has come into existence, still a loss early in the season could potentially kill your chances at contending for a national title. Now, the you know, the people who are kind of the big picture folks, they'll tell you, well, there's only two teams really that contend for the national title. Everybody else is still chasing them. But I think what a playoff does is it creates more opportunities for what we would think the best team in the country would be to lose and opens the door for everybody else. I, I, I like the idea that on any given Sunday or in, any given Saturday, you know, Bama's going to go out there and have to prove it once again. Sure, it might be against UCF or BYU, but that's a good thing. Like, that's good for the sport. It's good for all these programs to get an opportunity to play in, in a playoff. Um, I don't think it waters it down. I don't think it cheapens the regular season. If anything, it makes the regular season more exciting and it enhances it. And then if, if a automatic bid through a conference championship is involved, then it increases the, the value of the conference champion where, 
a nine and say a nine and three team ends up winning the big 12 or the pac 12 well they're still going to get in it doesn't matter that they had several losses like sometimes you just get beat or if you have a tough non-conference schedule you just get beat but you should still have an opportunity if you win your conference because that's a tough thing to do that is not easy to do and so if you're able to do it you should be rewarded and not and more than just a holiday bowl appearance or a, a fiesta bowl that's not part of the playoff I love playoffs. I think it it just makes everything more exciting and more fun. And I really, I really, really hope, Josh, really hope whatever format they decide on, the very first round of games becomes college site games, like campus site games. It would be a travesty to me to keep all of these neutral sites. And to be honest, I'd get rid of all of the bowls altogether and just go to like the Super Bowl or have or do like March Madness and you have regional sites like the Super Bowl, like in the final four or the final you know, four games in the quarterfinal round, you have regional sites where it's like, you know, the Sugar Bowl, um, the, the Peach Bowl, the Fiesta Bowl, and then something up north that allows it to be more of a regional game so that it's easier for travel. Because you want to have more local fans, more fans of those teams in those games, in those stadiums, making it a more exciting environment. But I really would like to see you know that first round of games at least be on campus. One, it'll help the universities get a better payday. Two, it just creates a more exciting atmosphere. And if they could figure out a way to do that through the first two rounds before they get to the semifinal round, that would be the best situation, the best case scenario for me. So under that scenario, you're probably looking at 16 teams, I think, for – you know, expanding out because, you know, as soon as you get down to four, I don't know that we're, we're looking at home sites there, maybe in that round of eight, they, they could, uh, you know, they could still do that. I, I like that idea though. I think it's exciting to have home sites, John. I, I love the idea of Oklahoma hosting a playoff game. Right. And then, you know, the more, the more you expand this thing out, whether it's 12, 16, whatever it is, Yes, I get the argument that, hey, we went from two to four, and oh, by the way, it doesn't always, a lot of times, hadn't looked like number four belongs in the college football playoff. So the argument would be, okay, well, why are you going to go from five to 12 or to 16? How is that possibly going to be better and create more parity? Maybe I'm crazy in this, John, but I think, you know, four, because it's still, you know, that's still a pretty select group of teams that make the college football playoff it's so small that it does feed itself to the recruiting rankings always stay Oklahoma and Alabama and Ohio State you start opening that door up to 12 16 okay well now there's a lot more access to the college football playoff and I do think that it lends itself potentially to creating more parity than we saw in the jump from the BCS national championship to the four-team college football playoff so that aspect of it I really like I think that would be healthy for college football, look, I'm like you. I love anything that's nice for the suitors. That's why we do the Locked On Suitors show. But ultimately, if you're thinking big picture for college football, it would the Oklahomies, you even have to agree, it would be nice to have a little bit more parity, I think, across the board in college football. And home games would be amazing in the playoffs. Hosting a game in Norman, are you kidding me? I love that. Sounds great. Yeah, just – get rid of like the chick-fil-a bowl and the holiday bowl and all that or, or or keep them that's fine you can keep them but don't make them part of the playoff please like you can keep your you know your group your new year six bowls if you want to and, and make and keep them as part of the playoff i think some of those are strategically positioned where it's going to be okay but man we don't need to go to the insight.com bowl you know for a playoff game we don't need to go to like I don't know, pick, pick another one, random one. But I think, I think there's a way you can keep some of those bowl games still a part of it, but the then make them, ones, New Year's yeah, six. yeah the, your new year's six bowls. You can still keep those as part of it, but yeah, don't just figure out a way to make some of these games on campus because it'd just be so much more fun. Like a, a Mich- you know, Michigan hosting a game in the, in the wild card round or so against Oklahoma or against the Texas, that would be amazing. Like that's part of the beauty and the romantic part of college football is these these home environments. Use that to your your greatest opportunity in the playoff. Like that's the best part of college football, right? It's not the bowls. 
it's the home sites that have these huge tra traditions, in my opinion, where we get pumped when we see, you know, jump around happening in Wisconsin. You know, we get, you know, pumped when we hear inner Sandman, you know, coming over the speaker in Blacksburg. Like those are the things that make college football what it is. So use your home sites, make that the biggest part of your playoff. And I'd even say, you know, the wild card round and then that, that last group of eight, make those home site games and then go to your, you know, rotating new year's six bowls after that. I think that's a, a great way to do it. And there's still enough teams where you can fill out those new year's six bowls. They just might not be a part of the playoff or you can, I mean, they're still so regionally located. You can make those part of the playoff in that next round where you have Ellis Alabama hosting at the sugar bowl in new Orleans or Oklahoma hosting at the Cotton Bowl in Dallas. Like that's so regionally located that it could make a little bit more sense. But give me a home playoff game in Norman, please. Just please, please, please. We're going to find out more about this come Friday. We're going to pick games on tomorrow's episode using Bet Online's odds. We're going to break down UTEP, our keys to the game, things we're looking forward to seeing as well. But that's going to do it for today's episode of Locked On Sooners. Thanks so much for tuning in, subscribing to the show wherever you get your podcasts and over on YouTube. Also, make sure you hit the notification bell to let you know when new episodes drop. Follow the show on Twitter at Locked On Sooners and on Facebook, Locked On Sooners Podcast. Follow Josh at Josh on Ref and myself at John Nine Williams. Until next time, where we're going to break down OU and UTEP. Catch you then, Boomer Sooner.